Hi everyone, uh, welcome to Ambi Talk, uh, the air sessions. I'm Ron Cooney and this series of interviews I'm going to be talking to leading experts in academia and industry uh, about air and the importance of the air we breathe, the impact uh, on, on us of the everyday environments that we occupy and how these environments really are, are changing and will set to change in, in the years to come post uh, COVID-19. So at the moment, you know, globally, we're over 90% of our lives, uh, of our entire lives is, is spent indoors, be that in, in our homes, vehicles, workspaces, things like that. So uh, really sort of interesting to see that, you know, there's, there's little, if, if little knowledge really known by, by most people of that environment and its importance really on our long-term health. So I'm delighted to have Gavin Phillips, the acting head of mathematical and physical sciences from the University of Chester today to discuss this in a bit more depth. So hello, Gavin. Hi, Ronan. How are you? Good, good. Thanks. And thanks a million now for taking out the time. I, I know since uh, COVID's kicked in and we, we were discussing earlier that it's uh, kept you busy and on your feet with plenty of different projects. So thanks for, for doing this for us. So um I suppose, Gavin, we might just kick it off. You might just be able to, to tell everyone a bit, bit about your background and how you've ended up. Uh, I know you've taken a few twists and turns along your career to date, how you've ended up where you are at the moment. Yeah, um, yeah. I originally studied chemistry back in the 90s um, at, at Loughborough, and I did a PhD uh, at University of Leicester in atmospheric chemistry, so chemistry of the air. Um, and I focused on the chemistry at about 10 kilometres in altitude and spent a lot of time um, analyzing field data from uh, aircraft uh, measurements. Um, I worked for a number of years for the UK government for a, for a research institute called the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, where I was an atmospheric chemist. And we used to do uh, air, air science, so uh, physics and chemistry of air all around the world. And we, we used to look at the impact of cities, of uh, e uh, different types of ecosystems and land use, like uh, rainforest or palm plantations, uh, other types of farming, livestock. And then I, I moved to Germany for three years and was a research fellow at the Max Planck Institute for Chemistry doing very, very similar thing, uh, the chemistry of the air and the air pollution, so outside. And uh, in 2014, I moved to the University of Chester and I, I, I took up a position as senior lecturer in natural sciences and I'm still there, uh, kind of in that position today. And I noticed that there was a area that was fallow and that was, and that was the, the science of the indoor environment in terms of my area, which was, which was chemistry. So now I'm, I, I run a number of grants on um, using engineering and um, to manage um, healthy indoor environments and understanding how we impact our own health by our own activities indoors. Great. And I see you even got to spend some time in Alaska at one stage, is that right? I, I did. Yeah, I forgot. Yeah, I did a postdoc. <laughs> I, like, after I graduated my PhD, I did a, I did a postdoc. So one of those short term academic jobs you do. But I, I was in I was in uh, University of Alaska Fairbanks for a couple of years and I was studying the photochemistry of snow. So <laughs> it, it turns out, turns out the snow does a lot of chemistry. So which you don't, which you didn't really, which I didn't know at the time either. But I did, yeah, I did yeah. after I after I'd done that job. So you, you've gotten around over the years, anyway. It's great. Yeah. And uh, maybe just give us a bit of a rundown on some of the projects that you're running currently in the university. So I'm quite I'm quite active actually, and we do various projects, and and they tend to be they're funded by different funders. So we work with industry like yourselves and and other companies, um, on issues to do with indoor environments and, and air, air quality and air chemistry in general. So we've got projects involved in sensing systems and using various types of clever data science to understand how sensors can help us manage indoor. Um, we have internally funded projects. One of the projects we've got going, kind of, it's kind of going at the moment, we've been looking at safety under the, the pandemic conditions. So how many people can you have in an indoor space for particular ventilation rates? So using monitoring, uh, using um, carbon dioxide monitoring, using other measurements of um, indoor sort of uh, traces of air quality and understanding and modeling how, how safe you can be and maybe predicting what, what safety might look like in the, in the future and maybe trying to understand how much 
how much money you could save by improving the health of indoor spaces. Um, we've got some government money to study how indoor activities in homes, so cooking and cleaning in your own home, how that impacts your air quality in the house. So when you cook, you're, uh, especially, for example, when you fry, you emit a lot of particulate matter, and that particulate matter is breathed in by, by the cook or anyone else in the area if you, you happen to breathe those particles before they're ventilated out of the room. So there's interaction between building physics, the design of spaces, the activity of occupants, and the activities you do. So, you know, whether you're frying, you're cooking bread, you know, you're, you're using gas hobs, which emits nitrogen dioxide instead of, instead of using, say, an inductive hob, you know. So a lot of these different issues we're, we're studying. Very good, very good. And uh, you sort of mentioned there briefly, but is that funding, are you seeing it coming from industry or from like government sort of level or a bit of both or which is really sort of driving it, do you feel, at the moment? I, th I think... Um, I think it, it's kind of a bit of both. So we certainly see more interest from industry um, asking us to test equipment and to calibrate sensors. Um, so th there seems to be a lot of people who I haven't heard of going into the market of, you know, measuring indoor air quality. And, and but, but there's also interest from the building asset management world, uh, you know, to, to understand, you know, what systems are good because these people have come out of the closet and told and asked, you know, oh, buy our system, it's great. And and I'm getting asked, you know, which which is the, you know, are these people talking sense or are they not? A lot of people are asking that. And um, generally, you don't get government funding unless reviewers think it's worth doing nowadays. And so the fact that we've got um, UK Research Council funding to study indoor activities and the impacts on air means that it's far more salient, you know, now, and it's far more, it's realized that there's a lot of impact that could be had from understanding far more about our, our indoor environments and, and the chemistry of that, as well as, you know, the, the great work that's gone on in the past um, in engineering about, about indoor air quality. And then do you feel since sort of COVID-19 has sort of become a, uh, a pandemic really that uh, that sort of increased so that that interest has increased externally and, and you're seeing more and more of these projects sort of coming online or about the indoor, indoor um yeah i mean i mean i can't give you i couldn't give you a quantitative answer but i, I could say my feeling is yes definitely i mean one of, one of the things i did really early on in the pandemic is uh when i i go to a coffee shop all the time and it's in an old you know nice old sort of building but it but it 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 doesn't have a ventilation system. And so I, I, I know the owner and, and we, we, you know, we did some calculations and we worked, uh, we worked out the size of air cleaners that possibly that, that, that she should install. And so, so, you know, even, even, you know, everyday people are thinking, Oh, we didn't realize, you know, we, uh, we can manage maybe COVID risk yeah. by management, managing ventilation and understanding the balance between um, clean air and yeah. um, healthiness. You know, and and yeah, it, it definitely is far more salient. And we we got money internally in the university to address COVID issues, and my group was in a position to help because we knew a bit about the subject. So you know, we were just sat there, and they and we, and we saw an opportunity, and they gave us the money. So we wouldn't have got that money normally to do yeah. monitoring of of indoor spaces if if it hadn't been for the pandemic. And there's certainly a lot more about ventilation on the news nowadays yeah. um and so yeah i, I definitely think it, it's starting to to be more of a, a more commonly um recognized as a as, a, as an issue yeah and it's, it's funny that i suppose a, a lot of the time uh, academic work doesn't get front page news or the coverage maybe that, that that it should and i guess that's one of the things that we're, we're seeing with covid that really this academic work is so important and the results that that it drives that really builds everything can build from there it's it's given that base base in, in academic work so you know it's it's great to see that that importance being shown on the work that you're doing i think at the moment which is which is brilliant um and, and i guess then just around um the, the the campus you know and and student health and productivity and cognitive function and all this sort of thing it, I don't know how you've seen that importance of the change or the, the work that you've seen to date on, on that and, and the impact that that can have. So, so it's a, yeah, it's a, it's an area I'm really interested in. And um, certainly 
it's been a funny interaction because, uh, you know, if we go to university managers, you know, people and say to them, oh, well, you can actually, you know, productivity. So I, I would call it learning gain, you know, like improving. The students are all half asleep because the carbon dioxide is at 5,000 <laughs> ppm, you know, and, and, and they're not learning. And, and, and there have been a number of studies that have suggested that poor ventilation or possibly even CO2 itself, I don't know, but, but CO2 is a proxy for poor ventilation and these other, these other substances that are emitted indoors and can affect, you know, your, your ability to work and whether that's measured as productivity or whether someone's learned something effective. So obviously as a learning organization, so as a university, we're really interested in, first of all, the productivity of all the staff, but, but we're really interested in, you know, if the students are all asleep in class, and so the fact that we've done this work because of COVID on, you know, we, we've surveyed rooms on um, whether what the ventilation rates are. And, and, you know, it does give us an evidence base to start to have a conversation with senior managers, because previously, if we said, oh, can we have can we have five grand to go and measure CO2 in loads of rooms? They would like tell us to go away. But um, but we've had a reason to do it now, and, and it's been a really important reason. And so we've gathered evidence, and you know we, we're able to say to them, look, this space is good, and this space is not so good. You know, and and maybe maybe even clever management of space, you know, to to enable decision making. So it's not just about oh everything's terrible, like make it better. It's it's about having knowledge from systems like iot um you know using iot using using clever ways of understanding space and using like you said that that sort of underlying evidence base that poor air is not very good for you you know it's just it's a matter of persuading these senior people that actually you know invest in a little bit of money will we'll have these huge benefits these huge gains in student performance maybe a four relatively small amount of, of investment in understanding space. And I think we, we've sort of seen that really as well in, in some of the work and, and trials that we've done uh, with educational spaces as well, which, you know, schools have been one of the few areas that have been pretty much fully occupied during the pandemic. Monitoring those is really the realistic situation of what offices are going to get into. You know, it's whether you're students or you're in a university or an office, it's the same sort of impact that you're going to have through every industry, for every because sort of company and space that that's that's been there, so that's been very interesting to see. And, and how do you, do you feel then about? Um, I, I know like data and you know GDPR and all these sort of things then come, but you know with, with o, sort of open source data then and, and giving it back to the students so that they can see exactly what's going on on their campus or in their rooms or or whatever, and, and they're I guess engaging a bit more with with, with people like yourselves and. And they can see what's going on and, and feed that back to you. Do, do, do you think that's like an important part to it? Or I, I think it's really intrinsic. I think I think it's really important. So so I think at my university we have um, our senior management are really keen on the student um, students as citizens. So so being owning their owning their surroundings really so interacting properly instead of just being passive receivers of knowledge or wisdom or whatever. But um, I I certainly find they learn better if you give them realistic information and problems so if if you teach engineers and scientists you teach those students even any student it doesn't have to be an engineer or science student but about data about what what to believe what you can learn from data the fact it's not infallible and that you know what to to that you need knowledge that you need ethics you need data management skills you need to be able to program you need to be able to visualize you need a bit of creativity it's all it's all it's all really good and 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 i i do feel strongly that if you if you show students how things are relevant they a learn better but b they get engaged and they want to change things and they want to, and they want to suggest things so so I, I i certainly think that um what i do i try and get students involved i it really benefits it because sometimes i learn a lot from them sometimes like different perspectives i might not learn te technologically from them but I learn about how to use things or maybe what other people I'm assuming a lot of things and they're not and so so we everyone learns everyone gains from it so I think that as long as you know you 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 manage the data and privacy and and sort of the, the various you know sensitive um sensitivities around commerciality and uh, commercialization and 
and university's been a bit funny about those sort of things as well i think i think you you can certainly gain a lot from analyzing these these big data sets and and i could see i can imagine if you had schools you had a lot of schools involved in trials and you you could you could learn a lot from it and stu- students would learn a lot as well and it, it, i suppose that another thing that we used to have seen as well is like the, if you can't de- define the problem to begin with how can you tackle it so like you're saying the data side is is key but again like you're saying getting that feedback from students on their concerns and you know it, it is very worrying time for some people you know and and the risks that they're seeing every day of you know coming into university or school and to, to know that it's a safe place for them to go you know so yeah having that 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 talking with with the students and that interaction is is definitely interesting and, and, and key i think um and then i suppose just really to, to to end on it really it's just how do you see yourself or what do you think that the changes might be coming because of of covid really relating to so indoor air quality specifically and and how it's, it's really changed the world. Maybe maybe there's no going back in, in certain areas. And and what do you think that impact is is going to be? Well, I think I think a number of things. I think back back to what I said before is that in COVID's enabled a step change of investment in certain areas. So I know I know it's not this is not particularly relevant, but um, it's kind of relevant. But we've invested a lot of money in online learning. So uh, there's a lot of learning that does not now need to take place in person, whether there's a pandemic or not, because mm-hmm. We, we, we all know it's fine. Like it, it's great. You, you know, you were busy. You had to take the kids somewhere and then uh, you were waiting somewhere. You could get on your phone and join the class. You didn't have to go, you know, it's a lot more flexible. And as long as it's done well, it's fine. But that means space management has changed. Yeah. And, it, and, and so we've, we've affected space usage. So maybe in a university, especially, or maybe even in offices as well, although, I, I talked to one of my brothers who works in, in in a big company that has lots of offices, and they they seem to be really conservative. They like as soon as they want to go back, they would they just did everything the same again. And so, yeah. but but in the university, they think things might change. The other thing it's done is, like I said earlier, it's given me money for a particular reason. But like you said, we've scope we've now realized we've got evidence of another issue. Which, which we knew about, but then no one would listen to us. So we, we, we measure the indoor air quality, or we, we look at ventilation rates and we understand them. We've got hard data and we can show senior managers and organizations. And, and you know, if we're clever enough with the econometrics, if we can, if we can be persuasive and say, you know, this, this is euros or pounds you're, you're wasting here and it for, for, you know, your huge return on investment, you know, it's, it's just persuading these large asset owners or senior managers in university that, that really it's worth their time when, when they've got a lot of other things on their mind, like keeping the students safe, keeping them happy, you know, keeping the staff and stressed or everybody stressed. And so it's, it's, it's finding a bit of space and all that noise to make this argument at the moment. Um, so whilst COVID's provided like an advantage, it, it's also provided a challenge because there's so much going on. Yeah. People are like indoor air or oh, well, it sounds a bit odd. Um, <laughs> I don't know. So, the, the building regulations in the UK uh, are out in consultation and in part F, so the ventilation part for commercial buildings, um, it's been suggested that uh, ventilation be monitored in spaces, in some office spaces and using, for example, carbon dioxide monitoring. So it is getting in government regs. So as soon as it gets in government regs, it becomes salient because it's pounds. So, you know, I, I think uh, indoor air and, and the monitoring of indoor air will become far more normal. And um, we will hit the problem that, uh, you know, some people will do it well and some people won't do it well. And, and it, it's, it's just, you know, ha- having the skills and the knowledge to understand when it's just been done to hit the building regs or it's actually going adva- to give you a monetary advantage as well. Yeah, um, keeping that quality and, high, I guess. Yeah, keep, yeah. Keeping the quality high and, and, and really providing an advantage instead of just doing it for doing it safe. Because, uh, you know, everyone knows, you know, they they probably live in a house that was built to some sort of standard of building regulations. But those those were correct when the house was built. You know, when your extractor fan stops functioning or starts making a funny rattling noise and you just don't use it, 
it's not doing anything anymore. And so it hopefully real time monitoring of the state of operational sort of status of buildings will mean that these sorts of things, you know, in domestic environments, yeah, that's a different kettle of fish, but um, in, in, in work environments, maybe it'll be far more salient that building systems are not operating correctly or, or they could be operating better and they could be providing productivity gains maybe and, and certainly better spaces to work. Yeah. Definitely. Okay, Gavin, well, thanks for your time. Uh, some very interesting points there and I really appreciate the input that you've had and, and like I said, taking the time to talk to me today. So um, much appreciate that and um, yeah, talk to you soon. Thanks, Ryan. Take care. Yeah, cheers.